Hello, Internet. I'm the Disney Brain, back with part two of the Power Rangers Not Top 10. Last time, we discussed some pretty good to average seasons. Seasons that didn't quite make the top 10, but that I still mostly enjoyed or thought had noteworthy high points. But now, things get a little bit dicier as we round out this video series by discussing the actual worst Power Ranger seasons. Turbo proved to be the straw that nearly broke the camel's back. At a time when even the Beetleborgs of all things found ways to pull in some viewers, Turbo repeated Zeo's biggest mistake of shaking things up, but only in largely superficial ways. And that's on top of being all around worse than Zeo, especially to start. I mean, what more really is there to say beyond breaking down all the ways Justin doesn't work as a character again? Things got better after TJ took over, but even then, the damage had already been done. The high school drama angle became overplayed, people got bored of it, and old school fans were starting to grow out of it. Turbo didn't necessarily do anything horrible, mind you, but they certainly didn't do anything special either, unless you count the Phantom Ranger who, while interesting, had a lot of the story elements planned for him cut out. And then, since the second half team is as new as we've had since the franchise started, there was a real chance there to build up a team of almost perfect strangers. But then we don't really get any of that until In Space happens and delivers actual conflict. Honestly, it seems like the only genuinely interesting things about Turbo is how it builds up to the mother of all seasons just a year later. We see that through Blue Centurion, who warns the Rangers that Countdown to Destruction is coming. And then there's that great season finale, which makes the entire 45 episode run feel like an absurdly lengthy prologue for the actual show. So while In Space thankfully saved the franchise, I gotta place Turbo as low as it is for damn near ending it. And speaking of ending things, I give you the season that officially marked the last straw for Saban and Friends. And this wasn't even the worst of the bunch. It wasn't easy sorting through the bottom five, but I gave Super Ninja Steel the slightest of edges for one important reason. Improvement. A term we can't really apply to any other super season. There's a lot of noteworthy problem areas that considerably worse Ninja Steel had that Super Ninja Steel flat out fixed. No more aggressively horrible one-off characters, instead we got a few pretty cool ones that basically stole the show. Calvin was an all-around better character, Haley got to interact with people not named Calvin, Sarah and what few flaws she actually had were challenged and kind of dealt with, and most of all, the lessons, either by way of Mick or just in general, had a way of sticking the landing so much better. That's not too bad, but everything else the season did just kept on pulling things backwards including whatever the hell they were thinking with their toothless, damn near cynical finale. Samurai is the one Neo Saban series where both seasons are going into one basket for the simplest of reasons. Not enough about the show changes to justify the super tag. And yeah, the fact that Rangers has forced that tag on us isn't great, but at least later seasons bothered to change something, anything, even if for the worse. But Samurai, while enjoyable and even genuinely funny in spurts, is in many ways symbolic of everything a season, and more vitally, a team, should not be. With the aggressively bad way Jaden and his backup dancers never internalize a single lesson, you'd be forgiven for confusing this Ranger run with a parody. I now refer you to example 1, where season 1 ends with Jaden giving up on teamwork and fighting Decker alone, in spite of damn near half the episodes training him to not do that. Credit where credit is due though, only a true holier than thou ranger could find a way to develop backwards. And what and what else could we expect from a Shinkenji retreading that somehow assumed Japanese cultural customs would make any sense in a western show? And then, the one thing they didn't copy made Lauren into something of a martyr for the season, while almost everyone else, but especially Mike, looked that much worse. But even then, it's not like there wasn't potential there. Namely with the serrator plot points that should have carried the villain side of the show, but sadly didn't. And ultimately, everything Samurai did, whether intentionally or not, comes off as more of a joke than a TVY7 hero's journey. Great for memes, but not so great as a rushed along season of half measures. Mm. 
Megaforce just barely escapes from the cold clutches of the bottom two on relative inoffensiveness alone. In all, it's a show that exists more than anything. It's certainly not trying to say anything of note or merit, and it's certainly not here to make you believe in the Chosen Five by way of engaging struggles, growth, or character arcs, you know, any of that stuff that a well put together season might have. Between phoning it in with the directing and phoning it in with the writing, you perhaps get the second most malicious feeling season to date. And if you think we suffered watching it, imagine what guys like Andrew Gray suffered going through it. I make fun of Troy a lot, damn near every chance I get if we're being honest, but Troy Burrows is not Andrew Gray's fault. But at the end of the day, Megaforce's biggest sin is not being special. I shouldn't have to be the one pointing out that an anniversary season means celebrating the entire legacy, not just one singular overly episodic point of it. And if that's all Megaforce wanted to be, then why bother with a Ranger Legends gimmick in the first season? That type of direct comparison by way of new Rangers literally staring at heroes that already saved the world should have written itself. But it didn't. Because nobody cared enough to write it. Look, here's a free one. You know how Gia's supposedly this tough blonde chick and Troy's the new guy expected to lead a team all of a sudden? Huh, that seems familiar somehow. Maybe bring attention to how familiar that is instead of whatever the hell Robonite was supposed to signify. Just a thought. Ninja Steel is the season you get when almost every idea collapses in on itself, resulting in this messy, out of touch, hurriedly slapped together final product. Essentially a much lesser version of Operation Overdrive, because this particular season lacks the forethought, ambition, and most of all, patience to accomplish anything. And there is a difference between an accomplishment and a resolution. Presto and Daddy Dearest working things out at the end of one of the season's worst episodes isn't an accomplishment. Neither is Princess Viera realizing that her entire life was a lie, or something. Ninja Steel would have you believe that they are, but what this show consistently does, maybe more so than any season, is set up a sizable, nuanced problem, and then resolve it in 30 minutes flat, if not less. And this isn't me being a homer for other better seasons either. I criticize poorly paced out plot points in every season that has them. It's one of my biggest points for or against any form of entertainment just in general. Time Force and Jungle Fury were among the best in this department, and Ninja Steel is probably the worst, which is a big reason why I have the season just below Mega Force. I'll take methodical build-up that ends up feeling earned in the end over quick and overly contrived drama any day of the week, which is sad because Ninja Steel had a real shot about taking this family angle that they use a lot and making it mean something. They managed that with the Robo Aiden stuff. That arc was legitimately the best part of the show because we finally got a bit of emotional weight, but everything else on that end is barely a half measure. And then on top of all of that, you've got the exceptionally bad acting, the embarrassingly bad humor, and villains of all the depth of a piece of paper who also don't really fit into the ninja motif at all. Even grading the woeful Neo Saban era on a curve, everything still falls flat from start to finish. Surprising absolutely no one is the super mega bottom of the barrel. How bad does a season have to be to throw in the white flag of surrender and choose to blind us with soulless fan service instead? Pretty damn bad. And doing so, in my opinion, made Super Mega Force the worst season of Power Rangers. The season where they just said screw it and gave a simple explanation for everything, except they weren't kidding. And maybe we could have had something here if the cameo centric episodes had all been framed like Casey's appearance. Sure, even that episode ended up being meaningless for Jake and Emma, but at least it somewhat followed through on what a season like this should have been from the beginning, learning to become legends. Sadly, this season does fan service so limply that random Sentai suits make more of an impact than some of history's actual Power Rangers. It's disappointing, but then you ask, what could they have done? It's not like there was a legacy season already out there that either Megaforce could have used as an example of not just a Great Ranger show, but a universally beloved one. If only there was a season that fully embraced the legacy of power damn near perfectly, while also having an engaging characters that steadily developed as time marched on. But by now, I think I've made my point. If you're going to promote a season as this big party with endgame fireworks to cap things off, 
do it all the way. Celebrating Rangers doesn't exclusively mean copying the aesthetics, the powers, or even some of the personalities, because at its core, the franchise has always been about more than that, meant more than that. At its core, it's about people of divergent backgrounds and mentalities working through the hurdles associated with being a team. But this team doesn't go through any real hurdles, they hardly ever clash, and only Noah is ever forced to be introspective about his place in all this. At the end of the day, Troy and friends felt almost exclusively like hollow shells meant to fit into tight spandex suits, and because of that, they never ever felt like real people struggling to save the world even when they did struggle. And if a season can't make the Power Rangers people first, then I can't really feel all that bad for placing them last. And so ends the Not Top 10. Ideally, we can avoid any shouting matches in the comments. I know that a list like this will naturally flare up tempers one way or the other, but try to be mindful of your fellow fans here. And more importantly, if you like any of the seasons I ragged on, please do not be afraid of proudly expressing that. I am not here to tell you what to think or how to think. I am here to tell you what I think and create civilized discourse as a result. Emphasis on civilized, obviously. And if you want to talk to me specifically about anything here, hit up my Discord server because that's the best place for Ranger Talk. And as always, thanks for watching.